looking forward to presenting this talk, Parallel Processors. Um, this talk is a bit different from a lot of the other talks, like the talk that you just saw from Stefan, if you were here. Um, this is uh, a vision talk uh, and a, a talk about what, you know, what could be done. Um, and it's also a talk about an analogy. Uh, the analogy, the emerging analogy between large language models and a layer much lower than them in the stack, the metal, um, this intersection of processors, uh, kernels, and user applications. And there are three basic goals that I have in this talk. Uh, one is to draw attention to some of this work that I really like at the intersection of large language models and systems. Uh, the second is to inspire some of you to do some future work there, especially on uh, efficiency and on agency, two problems where we need a lot of improvement to deliver on the promise of large language models. Uh, and then finally, to explain just uh, what the heck Carpathy has been tweeting about recently. Um, if you walk away and can understand his recent tweets, then I've done my job here. Um, also. As a sentimentalist, I want to dedicate this talk to my great uncle Bill, who worked on uh, the semiconductor process at Intel in the 70s, um, and to my sibling Teddy, uh, who shipped their first web game app to external users this week, and uh, everybody who's worked on computers in between. All right, so what's the TLDR of what we're going to cover here? So, there's been a lot of excitement about transformer-based large language models in the last year and change. Uh, a lot of people have been claiming that they're a software 3.0, a new type of computer. Uh, I, that can be made a little bit more rigorous. They are differentiable natural language processors. We'll talk about what that means. As many have pointed out, LLMs are in their demo era right now. We can produce demoware very effectively at a rate of like five banger tweets a day. Um, and a lot of people have complained about that, uh, but this was also how personal computers got started. So we'll talk a bit about that and the connections there. Uh, we've also seen a wave of efficiency improvements to large language models in the last year ported basically directly from the layers closer to the metal, like paged memory. Uh, we'll talk about those. There's a hope that we can actually port more sort of conceptual things from the operating system kernel layer in particular to make something like an LLM operating system. And I'll uh, put a little bit more meat on the bones of that idea. Um, I think we're not quite there yet. We're missing a few pretty critical things uh, that I hope we can work on in the coming year uh, on large language models to deliver on that promise. All right, so now, if you're the impatient type, you can just leave now and you've got the, you've got the gist. So, you have maybe seen the claim that large language models allow us to have a new kind of computer. Well, what, what kind of computer? Differentiable language processors, what does that mean? The computers that we have now are based off of central processing units that perform logical operations on address-based memory. Transformers are very different. They perform vector-based operations on content-based memory. Uh, this also means that transformers and the programs they execute are not Turing machines. They're a thing called a RASP machine, uh, which did not exist before transformers were invented. Uh, and CPUs created a particular collection of user interfaces that we're now all very familiar with, terminal user interfaces and graphical user interfaces. These transformer-based models uh, unlock perhaps natural user interfaces, a holy grail of human computer interaction. So double clicking on each of those points in turn, uh, CPUs perform logical operations on address-based memory. So this is, these diagrams are from NAND to Tetris, which builds up a basic computer and operating system from the logical gates up to the game of Tetris. Uh, and the introduction begins saying that every digital device is made from the same building blocks, elementary logic gates. These elementary logic gates take in zeros and ones and output zeros and ones, like this adder gate uh, shown here. You put in some zeros and ones and you get out zeros and ones. We're maybe used to thinking of zeros and ones as trues and falses in Boolean operations, but you can implement addition and, and things like floating point operations using only these truth values. Uh, the memory in our computers is also based on the same basic principle of these logic gates. 
Uh, so this is, this is what all of the applications that we have talked about at this conference in the end compile, compile down into these Boolean operations. I just want to quickly draw your attention on this slide to the tiny fire emoji next to a link. I put those next to resources that I think are particularly useful and interesting uh, so that I don't have to keep saying it every single time. So watch for the fire emojis on a slide that you like. So transformers are a new computer. Are they doing Boolean logical operations? If you want to get technical, yes, because when you go down, they are implemented on the computers that we already have. Um, but the computers that we already have are also implemented on the basis of the differential equations that describe the evolution of electromagnetic fields. So, you know, they're not digital and binary either. So let's uh, follow those principles of abstraction and say, what is the natural way to express the kind of operations that transformers do? Uh, so transformers do vector operations on content-based memory. So the diagram you see on the left of the slide there is the classic uh, transformer architecture diagram. And in the middle of the slide is a slight reorientation of that diagram from the folks at Anthropic. So you normally, when you think about the operations of a transformer layer, you think, oh, I do some attention thing, and then I do some feed forward neural network thing, and then I create the outputs. But very critically about transformers is this residual connection that goes along the side here. And these boxes represent the different operations, but this one in the middle, this add one, is a very simple operation. Ignore the normalization factors, that's a gradient flow thing you know, they could be removed. Um, and in fact, recent work has removed them in, in many cases. So focusing on this, we're just adding something back in. And what this means is that we, when we do our operations, we preserve the information. We don't destroy it to create our outputs. Uh, so we can reorient ourselves drawing this line here of all of the information passing from the input to the transformer all the way to its final outputs. And that's following this line here, but just sort of shifting everything on its side. And following a similar algebraic transformation that allows us to reorient how we're thinking about the keys and queries and how we're thinking about the uh, MLP layer, uh, we realize that what's, what's kind of really going on inside this architecture is that inputs come in, something is read out of them. So we extract information from a high dimensional vector down into a low dimensional vector. And that information is transformed in some way and then written back out to the same place that it came from. So this looks a lot more like reading from a memory and writing to it. Uh, so read from memory, transform, write to it, just like we had in the um, more familiar uh, logical operation case. But now our fundamental operation is not some truth table describable thing. It is a uh, much more vibes-based, content-based, um, operation on that memory. Uh, so there's, uh, the details of how exactly that works are still being worked out by the folks at Anthropic, OpenAI, OpenAI and elsewhere who are working on uh, decompiling these transformers. Uh, but a really useful mental model comes from the world of theoretical neuroscience where content-based memories have been used quite frequently. You can imagine, like, if you put in an incomplete uh, something like this incomplete picture of Homer Simpson and you compare it to complete pictures of Simpson's characters, the thing that's most similar to it is this completed picture of Homer Simpson. And so that's content-based memory. I don't have to have a pointer to Homer. I can have something that vaguely reminds me of Homer and then I can get Homer back. So this is the core internal of language models. It what's, it's what makes them so powerful, so able to transform our documentation from Python docs to JS docs or to answer in the style of a pirate and to operate these analogies. Um, it's also what makes them so frustrating because you can't tell them to look up information at a specific spot. So this is the, this is the core new computer that we have. It's this uh, high dimensional vector based content addressable memory machine. We have a wonderful, for those who celebrate, model for uh, CPUs in the Turing machine, uh, which has a tape of symbols. It reads from that, from that uh, tape of symbols. It makes a decision about where to move on the tape and then what to write in the new position. Uh, so this model actually predates the original, the like creation of computers uh, as a model of computation. Uh, so, do we have something similar for transformers? What I described as a very mechanistic thing about the actual guts. Do we have a nice algebraic model for them? 
Uh, the answer is yes, kind of. Uh, it postdates the invention of the transformer, unlike Turing's machine. Uh, the trans each transformer is what's called a restricted access sequence program, a program that transforms one sequence into another sequence, but, f but has restrictions on the manner in which it can access that information. So this is probably not the time and the place to describe a novel model of computation, uh, so I strongly recommend Sasha Rush's tutorial on this raspy uh, that goes through how to do this in Python, um, in like write a Python program that can be compiled down to transformer weights that do things like count open and close parentheses and things like that, classic CS stuff. Uh, the TLDR is that sequences are transformed into other sequences via, via element-wise operations, like is this equal to the letter L? So I can take hello and turn it into a sequence of zeros and ones that way. Uh, you can also select and aggregate, and this is kind of the equivalent of the attention component of a transformer. You can say, I want to look for all the tokens that match this current token. So all the letters that are the same as this one. Uh, so all the letters that are the same as L, and that will, so you can select with Boolean predicates over the sequence, um, and then you can aggregate via sum. So that restricts your ability to access the sequence. You can't do whatever arbitrary operation you want. You have specific access patterns that you have to follow, but by combining these operations of element-wise plus Boolean predicates, you get out uh, like pretty complicated behavior. Um, so it's very different from the way we think about programming computers and the way we do computer science for doing you know, big O notation for the behavior of machines, um, but it provides some of that similar ability to like write very um, like, yeah, mathematical or controlled code and then you know, execute it. So this doesn't give you GPT-4, um, but it does give you a model for the kind of thing that GPT-4 is. So great work from DeepMind, by the way, primarily setting this up. So CPUs, this different type of processor, created a bunch of user interfaces that we know and maybe love, like the terminal user interface um, and the graphical user interface uh, that allow us to interface with the hardware and, and get, our, uh, get our stuff done. Uh, so what kind of interface can these new processors make? I think this question's a little bit unanswered yet. Right now, the interfaces that they're making are mostly just chatbots. Um, but that's kind of lame uh, and maybe just an artifact of history. So with a new computer and a new interface, perhaps that interface is the NUI, the natural user interface. This is an idea that goes back to the very foundations of human computer interaction, which is that the ideal user interface is something that just like directly plugs into our intuitions about an object or about a system and all our actions as a user to interact with that system are exactly the ones that the system expects. Uh, so this is a pure, purely a demo, but from the folks at New Computer, uh, who this demo shows like what would it be like to have like an online shopping experience that's integrated with my home, with a magazine on my uh, on my desk, where I could just tap a picture and say like send this dress here and maybe this, ooh, that's a cute dress here, to that friend I was gonna do Halloween with this year. So that's the kind of interface that if you're interacting with another human, you can, that can get turned into actions in the world in a pretty reliable manner. Uh, but we don't have that with computers. We have to make sure to match people's uh, schemas and, uh, and click very precisely in their interfaces. So there's wonderful talks from New Computer and from Adept on this idea. Um, that of, of what these interfaces might be like where we've sort of rethought from the ground up now that we have something that's less like metal and more um, uh, softer or, or vibes based. Uh, all right, so that's this kind of high level vision of what this new type of computer is. As a new type of computer, there are a ton of analogies that can be drawn uh, historical analogies, technical analogies uh, with the computers that we have already. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk through this historical analogy for a specific thing, which is the demo era of LLMs that we live in. 2023 was essentially the year of the demo. Um, I am not innocent of launching a, a very rickety LLM demo onto the internet for likes. Um, and a lot of people have complained about this, 
but one of the first demos of the first PCs was like actually the grossest hack imaginable. And we had in the mother of all demos, the mother of all demoware for almost like 60 years. Uh, so there is some utility to this demo era, um, even if it's maybe a bit embarrassing. Uh, liftoff for our, for personal computers was achieved with office software and we're just starting to see that kind of liftoff in um, productivity software with large language models. So perhaps peak demo year uh, um, for LLMs was Hustle GPT, which was somebody who was just prompting GPT-4 to make a business for it. Um, so I gave GPT-4 a budget of $100, told it to make as much money as possible, and then I'm just doing whatever it tells me to do. Uh, so this was like a viral Twitter thread that was like very fun to follow along um, where this, uh, yeah, this guy basically tried to run a small business that was oriented around like health exercise, things like that. Um, went out and like, you know, paid influencers and like bought ads and stuff. Um, so how did it end? It failed. Um, so there was like some cool stuff that happened along the way. It started kind of well, but then it just like crashed and burned, lost all the money. Um, let he use without sin of losing investors all of their money cast the first stone. But uh, this is not great. Uh, you don't love to see these like very non-robust demos. Uh, but the first demo of the Altair personal computer um, was similarly rickety. At the homebrew co a computer club, uh, uh, Steve Dompier used the fact that it was not electromagnetically shielded, shielded to program in songs by controlling the frequency at which the electronic components switched. And then like just put an AM radio next to it and then like you could hear, um, I forget the song, I didn't recognize it, some song from the 70s. Uh, and like this dude uh, named Bill Gates was like, this is a super cool demo and he went on to do some important work in personal computers. Uh, so, you know, in the, you know, future Bill Gates is perhaps sitting in a Langchain webinar watching a, watching a hack demo. Um, so we're in this like homebrew cognition club era right now, we should expect these kind of rickety demos, even an entire year in to this process. Um, another famous demo is the mother of all demos, which in 1968 showed off two people collaborating using computers with, they were both pointing to the same file, they were both interacting and editing it at the same time. They could see each other's faces, they could speak to each other and collaboratively edit. It's 2018 and this kind of works in Visual Studio uh, like 50, uh, 50 years later. Um, five years after the release of video, v VS Code live share, I still don't think they have like a good working video integration into that, which means the mother of all demos is still a bit demo wary to this day. But that demo inspired work for the last 50 years on improving and making usable these computing systems. Um, what actually made them usable on a shorter time scale was office software. So VisiCalc and Lotus123 with the spreadsheet, uh, WordPerfect with document editing, these things like caused mass adoption once people could actually make, their, make themselves more productive with them. And with Copilot in particular and ChatGPT as well perhaps, we're starting to see some of the first steps in that direction. Uh, the first steps of, of actually making people more productive. Uh, so pivoting, there's also the opportunity to use this analogy of transformer LLMs as a new computer to take the things that we have used to make computers more efficient since, you know, the, the first computers were built and just port them over to this new type of computer. So there's been a number of wheel reinventions in the last year that are very exciting. So the VLLM inference server ports the idea of paged memory. And this doesn't only make the thing a lot more efficient, but the manner in which it makes it more efficient unlocks actually smarter and better models, like Monte Carlo tree search based models. Speculative decoding ports the idea of speculative execution uh, over to language models and improves their efficiency. And efficiency isn't necessarily everybody's favorite thing, but it's allowing us to sort of cram more cognition into integrated circuits, which is in the end one of the most critical things to keep in mind as this field is developing. So the concept of paged memory is introduced for a number of reasons, but one of the key ones is that it reduces the fragmentation of our memory. So without paged memory, every process or task is allocated some big block of addresses, or it's allocated address by address, which is very painful. 
Um, in the case where it's allocated in large blocks, then if I have, say, three processes that each use up 150 memory addresses, and I have 550 addresses in my memory, I can clearly fit those three potatoes into my three potato sack. Uh, but only if I place them very carefully. If I misplace them, then I end up without the block to, to allocate to the, to the third process. If I instead break the memory up into a bunch of little chunks, alias pages, then I can give them out sort of piece by piece and ensure that with much higher probability I can fill up the majority of my memory and avoid being unable to allocate to uh, when, I, when it is in principle possible. So that kind of fragmentation of memory is referred to as external fragmentation. So fragmentation outside of a process, outside of a unit. Uh, there's also internal fragmentation, which is not depicted here. But you can imagine, if I give out 150 addresses to a program, that might be like the amount it needs eventually, but it might only need that when it's doing like one task for a brief moment that's very data intensive, and then it doesn't need it anymore. So you'd like to be able to pull pages in and out of a program as well, and that is called internal fragmentation when you aren't using all of the addresses. Um, so VLM uses pages to speed up inference of transformers by paging this key memory structure for transformers called the KV cache, the key value cache. And it's the basic idea of paged memory but applied to kind of like at the token level of saying I'm gonna store a bunch of information about an individual token, logically at the level of my like of a certain level of my CUDA stack, I'm able to just think of it as like a line of tokens one after another, or a line of representations of tokens one after another. Uh, but then physically, there's like, a li there's like the same abstraction layer, the same indirection, like a page description table that says, oh no, actually if you wanna find that, it's actually here. Um, it's not, uh, you know, they aren't one after another, they're actually split up. And this like substantially improves the memory usage and so the throughput uh, due to the memory boundedness of inference uh, of serving transformers. Uh, and so very large benefits both for external fragmentation and for internal fragmentation. Uh, so avoiding needing to allocate a bunch of, of memory for a sequence that doesn't need it and avoiding um, like having gaps between our, um, our, our sequences. So that's, that's very cool because of how much faster it can make your uh, language model inference, but I think the more cool thing about it is that this, it's handling that caching and memory allocation better is enough to actually make models smarter. Right now, when you draw samples from a language model, what basically everybody does is they calculate probabilities for next token and they draw one at random from that. And that's basically the s most naive way to sample from a probabilistic model. Uh, of sequences, just like token by token. It's called greedy decoding, and we all know greedy algorithms are bad. Uh, and one of the reasons why we don't do anything more sophisticated is because it requires very thoughtful caching in order to be able to handle like things like, try, like going forward in a sequence for a while and then deciding it was a bad idea and going backwards. The way a chess engine might try out a play, uh, determine it was a bad idea, and then roll back up and try out a different play. So for both parallel sampling, which is like just generate 100 responses to the user instead of just one, um, and for like the kind that I just described where you move forward and perhaps move back, the, you, the results in the VLM paper with page detention, they report huge memory savings, especially in the beam search case, and this will make models smarter for the same cost. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, it will also probably make them more deterministic, which is something people who are more opsy might care about. Um, there's other ways to speed up LLMs by porting from the metal layer. Speculative execution is a famous, infamous way to speed up processors by when you hit an instruction that will cause you to branch and go down different code paths, you can just kind of like guess which one you think is gonna happen next and then just start doing that in hopes that by the time you figure out what the result of that branch instruction was that maybe triggered a cache miss or something, um, you are already, if you were right, then you're already like pretty far forward and you have mitigated a bottleneck. The same idea has been directly ported to language models with speculative decoding, where you use a small model to generate a bunch of potential next tokens, and then you pass those tokens into the large model, and in fact the small model could be just like a regex, uh, can be like a deterministic rule. Uh, you pass that into the large language model, this collection of, of tokens, and it scores them in parallel 
Transformers are very fast when you give them a bunch of tokens that have already been made, but they're very slow when they need to make new tokens themselves. Uh, this is like, because they were designed to be easy to train, not easy to run in inference. Um, so the, at, in the end, this small model was like missed out and said this, the quick brown fox jumps into the something rather than jumps over a like lazy brown dog. Uh, but the large model got that right in the, and so we can keep fox jumps because that's what the large model thought was a good thing to say. Um, but we, and we can throw out into the, so we generated two tokens and the cost of this is roughly the same as one single forward pass, um, just due to the ability to parallelize the work. Uh, and so you've gotten two tokens for the price of one. Uh, and so you can actually pretty frequently realize this like two to three X improvement with us if you use especially like a stack of draft models, a regex drafting for a BERT that draft for a llama, for example. Uh, and the, the inspiration for this came directly from this uh, speculative execution idea. So those are both efficiency gains and I think a lot of people, especially the people who are more researchy, more excited about things like new computers are like less interested in those efficiency gains. But I think they matter, they're incredibly important um, for the same reason that efficiency gains in the construction of integrated circuits are important. You don't necessarily need to be able to know how to use extreme UV lithography yourself uh, in order to recognize the benefits that it brings. So in 1965, Gordon Moore noticed that the cost of integrated circuits was going down and the density was going up. So he looked at a couple of graphs and did like a kind of vibey, like how, you know, where is this price gonna go? Um, and we can see the same thing occurring with language model capabilities. So in the interest of time, I won't go in detail into this chart, but suffice it to say that for like certain capabilities, you can expect the price to exponentially decrease. And for um, a certain price, you can expect the capabilities to rapidly increase. This is a critical long-term trend, so plan for it. All right, so the more speculative thing past this, these efficiency improvements ported from the metal layer is can we also port conceptual ideas from the metal layer and end up with an LLM operating system? Operating systems are there to operate the hardware of the machine, the sensors, the internal components and effectors. MemGPT is a pattern that moves towards the LLM OS by adding interrupts and virtual memory. And maybe if we take those things, we go multimodal, we add some peripherals in a network, like we're there at the LLM OS. Um, the, at the operating system, the primary thing that it does, according to Tannenbaum and Bose, is that it takes the ugly interface required to operate hardware and turns it into a beautiful interface that an application program can use. It also handles the map between the like real-time world that hardware must live in and the clock-based world that processors live in. MemGPT does something similar for LLMs, uh, so it adds the ability, it, it places the model in a position of waiting for interrupts, waiting for information from the outside world. It also virtualizes the context. It makes it possible for the language model to change around what information is in its own prompt so that it can, and store that information elsewhere and retrieve it later. Uh, so that gives us the, um, like, both a sort of, like, local like RAM feeling kind of memory and then also an external store that's a bit more like a file system. Um, it's able to store a lot more information. Uh, so Andre Krapepi and others have sort of been like, oh, what if we kind of combine these patterns together? If we can, you know, if we can get information that's stored for a long time, that's kind of like a file system. Um, if we have models that know how to browse the internet, that's kind of like our ethernet connection, our network stack. Um, if we have multimodal models, then we have a connection to peripheral devices, to the screen, to sounds. And then if we have code generation and code interpreters, then we can interface with the classical computer. And so we have something that looks maybe like this diagram from Tannenbaum and Bose, but extended up a layer, where now on top of the beautiful interface of the system calls, uh, we have a new layer, the LLM, that creates a natural interface that application, that happens at the application layer down to the rest of the system, where humans can say things like, um, please order me that dress that I mentioned uh, an hour ago. Uh, so are we, you know, is that it? Is the diagram, are we ready to ship? Um, raising 10 million at a $10 billion valuation? Maybe, um, but we're missing a few things. Um, we're missing isolation uh, from LLMs. 
Uh, we're missing open architectures and open standards in an important way, um, and work needs to be done on both of these things. Uh, the trustless coordination of resources, the ability to run multiple programs on one machine or for multiple users to run on one machine is enabled by the isolation and security features from the hardware all the way up. Uh, LLMs resist this with fierce, uh, fierce, fiercely. Uh, GPTs leak their internal content and their prompts. Um, I got a model to leak its prompt by telling it I was needed to use its prompt to help orphans find jobs. Um, and if you use browse mode and you are tricked into going to the wrong website, you can uh, like uh, leak information and um, uh, that is not great. Um, so more work needs to be done on that security layer and Simon Willison has been kind of like raising the alarm about that and collecting those examples. Um, open architectures and standards, mostly one in the PC world, the things like the Xerox star from Xerox Park. A uh, beautiful machine, but you couldn't write your own programs for it. Um, whereas the IBM PC and its clonability uh, ended up creating a very dominant system, even on the basis of kind of like a weak chip. Uh, so can a similar process happen here? Um, I think it's possible, but it requires coordination and thought around incentives. So the open source initiative, um, which sort of helps crystallize this definition of open source in the late 90s is attempting to do the same for AI. We need this badly. Uh, Satya Nadella just called a model an open source release earlier today even though its model does not fit the open source initiative's definition or mine of openness. Um, there's also the AI Engineer Foundation which is starting to work on getting people together on protocols and standards uh, so that we can have a shared way of interoperability between our models. Um, so the stable versions of this are going to require thought around incentives for that kind of collaboration uh, just as there were economic models and incentive models for open source that have enabled it to be successful. So to recap, we have a new kind of computer, hopefully I've convinced you, with the Transformer LLM based on the differentiable natural language processor. Um, it's still in its demo era, but that's where we all start. Um, we've also seen this wave of efficiency improvements to language models that's been ported from the, the metal layer of classical computers. Um, maybe we're starting to port concepts into an LLM operating system that will enable a natural interface, um, but we're missing a few things, so let's go and work on it. Um, I'm, in the interest of time, I'll skip my plug for computational cognitive science. Ask me about it if you want later. Um, there's good stuff there. Uh, all right, thank you for listening and I will see you at the Q&A session.